Okay, so the next talk of the day, Project Data Privacy Management. Go for it. Introduce yourself and give your talk. You've got five minutes. Guten Tag erstmal. Ähm, mein Name ist Dennis Löhr. Ich ähm, bin gerade an der Fachhochschule Münster angefangen als äh, wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter und äh, führe dort ein Projekt zusammen mit äh, Benjamin Justus und äh, als Teamleiter Ulrich Greveler. Ähm, dieses Projekt beschäftigt sich mit, ähm, also heißt DAPRIM, ähm, steht für Data Privacy Management. Ähm, also grundsätzlich geht es darum, dass ähm, die privaten Daten ähm, ja, viel zu unsicher gehandhabt werden in vielen Firmen, ähm, beispielsweise Backups, die irgendwo rumliegen lassen werden, Festplatten, die äh, mal kurz so verkauft werden, weil man kann ja noch ein paar Mark damit machen. Und ähm, ja, als Motivation für das Projekt ähm, war, waren einige Datenpannen, äh, beispielsweise, dass äh, die Telekom vor ein paar Jahren 17 Millionen Datensätze mal kurz äh, bei einem äh, Callcenter verloren hat. Ähm, Allgemein äh, dieses fehlende Verantwortungsbewusstsein, ähm, beziehungsweise das äh, kommt zumindest so rüber bei vielen Firmen, dass sie ein fehlendes Verantwortungsbewusstsein für die Daten haben, ähm, hat uns dazu verleitet, äh, uns was auszudenken, wie wir dieses Ganze äh, besser schützen können. Ähm, eine erste Idee dafür ist äh, irreversibler Datenverschluss. Das heißt dass die Daten ähm, einmal eingegeben nie wieder in Rohdaten ausgelesen werden können. Also das heißt nur noch über äh, bestimmte erlaubte Abfragen äh, verarbeitet bzw. ausgelesen werden können, ähm, so dass diese Abfragen beispielsweise äh, kontrollieren oder dass über eine rechte Beschreibungssprache kontrolliert wird, ähm, dass bestimmte oder dass alle Nutzer zusammen äh, nur eine bestimmte Anzahl an Abfragen pro Tag stellen können zum Beispiel. Ähm, wie wir das Ganze durchsetzen, äh, dazu haben wir uns schon ein paar Gedanken gemacht. Ähm, ich habe vorhin noch was auf, dem, äh, auf der äh, Projektseite online gestellt, ähm, also vor zehn Minuten oder so. Ähm, das, äh, da ist so eine, Grund, äh, also so eine kleine äh, schematische Darstellung äh, des, der ersten äh, quasi Gedanken, die wir uns dazu gemacht haben. Ähm, Grundsätzlich wollen wir das Ganze so machen, dass Sie äh, eine Beschreibung äh, der Rechte, die beispielsweise Nutzer oder Nutzergruppen haben, äh, über eine rechte Beschreibungssprache gemacht wird, äh, beispielsweise ODL, X, XRML oder XACML. Ähm, und dieses Ganze dann äh, gestützt durch ein TPM-Modul kontrolliert wird, dass der äh, Rechner in einem sicheren Zustand ist. Dafür äh, setzen wir momentan äh, für erste äh, Versuche Trousers ein. Ähm, falls jemand da bessere Ideen hat, ich bin auch äh, bis zum letzten Tag hier. Ähm, und äh, um die Datenbank abzusichern, äh, werden wir wahrscheinlich eine AES-Verschlüsselung äh, äh, nutzen, wo dann der Key allerdings durch den TPM-Chip geschützt ist. Ähm. <lacht> Ähm, dieses Ganze äh, wird dann so aufgebaut sein, dass ähm, zumindest nach unseren ersten Vorstellungen ähm, die Datenbank in einem AES-geschützten äh, Container äh, gespeichert wird, sodass, äh, wenn das System nicht äh, in einem sicheren Zustand ist, nicht äh, die Datenbank entschlüsselt werden kann, da der äh, Schlüssel dafür auf dem TPM-Chip ist. Und ähm, dann über ein ODL-Parser oder XIML-Parser ähm, die Abfragen kontrolliert werden, ob sie auch äh, notwendig äh, oder äh, erlaubt sind. Ähm, dieses, äh, dieser Block wird dann äh, durch den TPM-Chip kontrolliert und äh, außerhalb dieses Systems ähm, wird äh, ein weiterer äh, Teil sein, der einfach nur kontrolliert, ob in beispielsweise einem Kerberos-System die äh, Nutzer überhaupt einen validen Login haben. Okay, damit bin ich durch. Check, check. Okay, so this one you actually have multiple slides, so when you are ready yes. for your next slide, just say slide real yes. quickly and I will advance it. 
So, without any further ado, are you ready to go? Yeah. Okay, synchronize watches, start. You think we could go one minute early, try to get ahead of schedule for once? Okay, cool. Ready? On one, two, three, go. Hello, everyone, or good morning. Um, my name is Rafael Kimensi, and I would like to present you Project Starfish. Slide, please. We all know about the various problems we have on the internet. We have control issues about the security and privacy of data. We need to ensure net neutrality. We have single points of failure due to centralization. And all is tied in with ensuring freedom of speech. What I would like to stress is that many of these issues, why all the activism and campaigning is important to do, they are actually issues of structure. Slide, please. So as you can see, we had a development. Um, telecommunication were very centralized. Now we have a somewhat centralized system. And what I'm proposing, what I think is necessary, is a fully distributed system for the internet, as you can see here on the right. Next slide, please. So um, in one sentence, it's about enabling the creation of a worldwide user-controlled network based on a distributed architecture. Um, I think the goals which can be achieved through this are free network access, strengthening local communities, improving network efficiency, and establishing individual ownership of the actual infrastructure, as well as having a contingency plan in case the old infrastructure, the centralized structure, should fail. Slide, please. Um, in terms of realization, we see that most of the important technologies are already available, and the others which we would need, such as software controlled radio, to access the full spectrum would become available in the near future. Slide, please. Um, the most important thing is to uh, understand the properties of such a network, which are primarily the absence of any centralized authority, which means you do not have a dependency anymore on any institutions, governments, or corporations. If you build, for example, a wireless mesh network based on these methods, principles, and on this architecture, what you also get is you get an equally shared ownership and equally shared power in the network. As you have seen, all the nodes would have connections to several other nodes, so there is no dependency on single points. So on the one hand, as you own part of the infra infrastructure, you have a heightened sense of ownership because you're part of it and you're a vital part of it, and you also have the power to solve issues. You don't need to call on a government, you don't need to call on an institution to fix your problem. You do it yourself within a community. So in a nutshell, it's really about Network neutrality, do it yourself with the community. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, why I think this is important? Because I see that the struggle which is going on, which has been going on since a long time, there are sometimes we win, sometimes we lose, but I think we really need to start thinking about the structure which we deal with. And the structure right now, as I see it at least, is against us. And this is why I'm saying, uh, please look into the project, visit my website, write me an email, or just talk to me to contribute to the concept, to the development, or the realization. I think it would be a good thing to do. Thank you very much. I, I neglected to mention this earlier, but you, you actually had... I didn't even give you your minute mark. You, you clocked in at 2 minutes and 47 seconds. I think that's a... <laughs> That's a record. Give him a round of applause for that. Oh, is, did Telecomics DNS show up? Freedom Box, are you ready to go? Wow. Okay, I knew we, I had hoped we would be a little bit ahead of schedule, but this is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> huh? Okay, okay, so so we have well, ten minutes is a little bit extreme. I don't think we have time for that. But should we perhaps we actually do have the time to grant all the speakers five minutes instead of four because we're ahead of schedule? Should we do that? All right. Are are you comfortable with that? I'm not sure. Oh, okay. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, well, you you don't have to stand on stage for five minutes. This isn't an embarrassment exercise of mine. You, you, you can you can vacate the stage in a I don't know do, but I would not recommend trying to beat the current record of two minutes and forty seven seconds that's a little bit but but that that was a pretty awesome achievement I don't think we've had that in a lightning talk um, so anyway are you ready to go yep. are you good okay you got the procedure down slides and then if you have time and you want to take questions the Herald Angels are ready to take questions and another thing I wanted to give a special thanks for for the audio angels in the back. Um, who are constantly recalibrating levels, making sure we don't have feedback, making sure it, it goes off quickly, and adjusting for every single speaker that comes on stage. A round of applause for the audio angels.
because this is one session where they actually have to work for it. So you ready to go? Three, two, one, go. Guten Tag and good morning to everyone. So I'm Arthur Lutz. Um, I'm part of the uh, Freedom Box community. So the pitch for the Freedom Box is uh, it's basically based on Debian. Uh, the idea is to have a very small home server that runs at home and that keeps all your privacy on all your data and so you can leave the closed cloud. So slide please. <laughs> That was the previous version of my slides. <laughs> um, doesn't matter, um, I'll just go on. Um, so uh, the idea, I had a few slides, but it doesn't matter. So uh, the idea is to, um, the, the principles that are behind the, the Freedom Box is to ensure the privacy of the user. Uh, so you don't have to depend anymore on uh, the closed cloud, which gives you applications that you use every day and that stores your digital life. Uh, your digital life, uh, you, you, there's ways to configure your privacy, but there's, they're always kind of not very satisfactory and so the idea is for every service that exists that we use or that non-geeky people use um, <laughs> I send you by email <laughs> that's, uh, that's a good example so here um, Um, okay. Oh, you get a shadow as well. <laughs> yeah, next slide, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the main key points are uh, privacy control, so you control your data. Uh, another one is ease of use, so the idea is that your mom can use it and uh, people, non-geeky people can set it up and use it, which we're pretty far away from that objective. Uh, so, getting rid of hierarchy as well is very important as in uh, the Starfish project. Uh, decentralization, so all the projects that are peer-to-peer -peer based uh, can fit into this thing. Uh, since it's a distribution based on Debian, there's already a lot of stuff that exists that can uh, fit in and be configured on that, and so very reliant on peer-to-peer. -to -peer. Slide. Uh, so, uh, it's a small home server on which you store uh, all your data, you set up your email, you set up your RSS reader, your status net, um, and, um, and all that kind of uh, glues in together. Um, so it encourages the fact of auto-hosting your data, auto-hosting your services, whether they, they be personal or uh, set up for publishing for other people. Um, and it provides alternatives to either payment uh, services or services where you don't really control your, your privacy. So, next slide. Um, so the first step of what should it do, it should do email, uh, maybe DNS, so look at projects like peer-to-peer uh, -peer DNS, I think it's Teleconnect. Uh, privacy uh, with Tor, identity, there's, we don't really know which, which ones to choose yet. Uh, instant messaging, calendar, so it's either personal or collaborative. Next slide. Um, on the web hosting side, uh, it might be like uh, microblogging, blogging, photo galleries, RSS readers, uh, social bookmarks, etc. Slide. And then you can extend it to if you have uh, a hard drive that's big enough, or uh, uh, or if the the machine is, is powerful enough uh, to voice over IP. Maybe peer-to-peer -peer search with Yasi projects, for example, backup, sync, peer-to-peer uh, -peer storage. There's some really nice peer-to-peer -peer projects that are, uh, out there. Uh, stream your music uh, to all your devices and outside. Uh, slide. Uh, the, kill the killer features that are uh, that we really want to put in are um, the fact that it can be transportable, so you can have it at home and then go somewhere else and just plug it in, and then it just uh, reconfigures itself. Um, when we get into the whole peer-to-peer -peer thing, uh, the idea is to have your uh, another box in your family and friends and stuff like that, and then communicate with each other. And so it, they, they each other backs backs up its storage, and you can uh, you can scratch it and then restore it from somewhere else, and uh, obviously usable by your mother. 
so no, it's cool. Uh, the hardware it could run on could be anything, but the 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 platforms we're looking at are uh, things like Chiva plugs, OpenRD, Socrus boards, flashable NAS devices. Uh, there it is, being uh, very low power and uh, and uh, just 24 hours, uh, se seven days a week um, uh, on in your in your home. Uh, next. So uh, existing alternatives, uh, go out and look at projects like uh, StatusNet, WordPress, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so all these are open source and they can replace more or less the services that uh, we or our friends use uh, out there on the web. Uh, what's missing is kind of the peer-to-peer -peer approach. There's already stuff like in StatusNet, for example, you can subscribe to another auto-hosted um, instance of status net and so they talk to each other and so uh, next slide so what is neat is for example for all those open source projects is to reduce their uh, footprint as far as memory and CPU consumption can be used so they can have uh, a fat version and a, a low and, and a light version and uh, so UE design and uh, peer to peer approach in uh, most open source software so they can talk to each other thank you very much being prepared unlike me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, no, here, let, let me, let me get, yeah. yeah. Hmm? Okay. Oh, yeah, we don't want to see that. Okay, Mitch, you're up next. And shockingly, we're kind of sort of back on schedule a little bit. Okay, Mitch, you ready to go? Sure. Okay. So I'm Mitch Altman, and um, uh, amongst other things, I go around the world teaching people how to make things, mostly with microcontrollers. Uh, next slide. Uh, I think microcontrollers are really cool. They're very powerful. They're very easy to learn. Anyone can learn them, and you can make use of them for your projects. So go ahead, next slide. Uh, one of my um, open source projects is TV Be Gone, which turns off TVs in public places with the push of a button. Uh, if we don't do it, who will? Uh, there's uh, a lot of open source hardware that's starting to become uh, popular on the planet. One of the ones that's been pushing it is Arduino. Arduino is an open source project that doesn't actually do anything on its own. Uh, next slide. But it is uh, a really easy way excuse me, to get into microcontrollers and electronics. It's designed for uh, non-geeks like artists and other non-geeks to uh, put tech stuff into their projects very quickly. The goal is within like 90 minutes starting with nothing and then having something cool in your project with tech. Um, so uh, it's also very powerful because it has a powerful microcontroller on it. So it's powerful enough for total uber geeks to do really cool things quickly. Um, so uh, there are now thousands and thousands of open source projects that use Arduino online that anyone can download for free and hack to your heart's content. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to have a workshop. Uh, at 2 o'clock, 1400 hours, it's three hours long, it'll be today, same exact workshop tomorrow, and uh, it's limited to about 25 people or so per day, uh, but I have plenty of parts and uh, you can come by and learn this incredible tool. I'll be using TV Be Gone as an example because it's super easy and of course I think a lot of fun. So we'll start by learning to solder. Now don't be afraid of this, I've taught over 10,000 people how to solder personally and my travels around the world, and you can do it. If four-year-old kids can do it, you can do it. And uh, it really is very easy and it's a lot of fun and it's very useful. We'll solder together a solderless, or, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, board we know. Since Arduino is open source, there are a lot of uh, copies, and this is one made by Lady Ada, which makes it super easy to put a project together very quickly. Once we solder together, we'll uh, go over how Arduino works, install the development environment, which is free and download downloadable online uh, on your laptop, and I'll show you how to hack some simple software. We'll put uh, TV Begone software on it, and then conveniently, Media Mocked a few years ago built a building across the street with plenty of target practice. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> 
So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun when uh, I do these workshops, uh, people get engaged and it's like little kids playing with blocks and we can all be those little kids totally engaged playing together. So um, come on by, it's in the basement in the hardware hacking area, uh, room A4, today at uh, 1400 hours, three hours long and the same exact workshop tomorrow uh, in the same room, uh, same time. So. Uh, Next slide, uh, I got a little bit, if there's anyone who has any quick question I can answer, uh, if not, yes, both days are exactly the same. Um, and um, yeah, so anyways, just see me uh, come by, uh, the hardware hacking area, by the way, is open all day, all night, every day, until they kick us out of BCC, okay, <laughs> so come on by and play. Yeah, you, you knew. I'll allow it this one time. Uh, the, the Telecomics DNS talk just showed up, actually, because he made the mistake of showing up for his scheduled slot instead of showing up for the lightning talk. So that, that's, that's one thing I guess we'll have to learn. If you're giving a lightning talk tomorrow or the day after, Maybe it's a good idea to show up half an hour early just in case we have a long slew of two minute and 47 second presentations. <laughs> right. Yeah. What? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. okay, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're gonna have to slip back to four minutes now. So, all right, my name is Daywalk, and um, I come from the Telecomics uh, news agency, and um, we have a project called Telecomics DNS. Please take the next slide. Um, so, it's basically uh, Telecomics DNS is a decentralized or distributed uh, DNS server network to complement the single DNS route. And the idea for this came uh, earlier, but especially when um, so a few domains started to be taken down, either by name servers being taken down or uh, by being seized for whatever reason. There are a few URLs there, but take next slide. So, next one. Here, yeah, so what DNS does, uh, really short, everyone already knows it, it resolves names. Uh, you take a name, you get an IP. That's, this is great, it works very well, but it synchronizes top down from a single root, which is starting to become a problem if it was good design from the start. Next slide. So this is basically the power hierarchy as I see it. We have a single root, it subdelegates uh, top domains, and you have registrars below that. And the problem is that you always have power over the ones below you. Um, you can take the next slide. Yeah, go on, there we go. So this makes we have a single point of failure. Usually the internet is very distributed, very decentralized, and you can never take things down uh, that, that easily, but it's very easy to do with uh, DNS, unfortunately. Yeah, next one. Okay, there we go. So this is basically what we're doing to replace the uh, single DNS route. And it's a, uh, net, uh, a um, yeah, distributed network of uh, authoritative DNS servers, uh, all with uh, PGP signing to uh, authorized domains. So the ownership of a domain is always in the domain owner. He always has the keys to change it, not the server owners. Yeah, next one. And when you register a domain, uh, you, have, you, take, you create a zone file through a web interface, uh, you sign it, uh, which creates a, I mean, a uh, authenticated uh, that you own the right domain, and it gets distributely distributed among the servers. Take next one, and we can skip this slide, it's fine. And here we are, uh, and when it actually comes to users, you have recursive servers, of course, uh, and the recursive servers talk both to the ones registered in the Telecomics DNS system as well as I can, so we always have the fallback to whatever existed before. And the reasoning behind this is, of course, um, we don't have to register everything. Uh, we don't want to and we don't need to. As long as the icon root is there, which I hope is forever, uh, we can still just add whichever doesn't fit there. Yeah, take the next slide. 
So this opens a bunch of new possibilities. As I mentioned earlier, seized servers or seized domains uh, can be registered and basically overwritten um, with, I mean, a few basic steps. Uh, so this was one of the projects that came out directly when we started working on it. Yeah, time? Uh, you've got your time right down yeah, there. Yeah, we've got there. Quite perfect. So, next slide. The state of the project. Uh, is, the goal was to have a proof of concept running uh, when we came here. It isn't running, but um, we're still working good on it, and uh, there's uh, plenty of interest, and the design is basically done. And uh, is it online? No, it isn't. But um, I'm hoping it will be fairly soon. So, um, that was all I had to say for now. Uh, we we'll have, have a table in the basement if anyone wants to discuss it or at IRC. Thank you. Oh, you have an update? Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Who? I sp spelled it. I, I figure I got time to do stuff like this, right? Also, if you're giving a presentation on day three or day four, please make sure that your slides are in over email at least 12 hours before your presentation. <laughs> but, but this is the first trial run of a lot of different things. This is my first time doing it, and I hope you guys are having a good time watching us try to get through it, but without any further ado, go. Okay, hi, I'm Matthias. Um, SAP is a company that makes uh, business software. I've been helping clients, SAP clients, uh, using the data warehousing application for the last uh, four years. And this is a little rant about what I've seen. Slide. Um, this is a formula editor for the reporting tool. Thank you. Um, the convenient thing about this is that everything is on the screen. You can always use the mouse. And the keyboard is even on the screen. And to make it even more convenient, the keyboard is blocked, so you're not even taken away from the command line, but you're also away from, taken away from the keyboard and you're forced to plug every digit and every plus and every function from the screen slide. Uh, in data warehousing, you have to always copy tables over and over again um, until they've, they're in a form which they're convenient for reporting. Uh, yes. Previous slide, please. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to say slide and not point. Um, yeah, and because the tables always look a little different, because the data model is always a little messy, um, this is what you're seeing when you want to map one table to another. You have to do it. Like, you have to go through 100 attributes on the left and find the corresponding attributes on the right and draw an arrow. And if the next guy takes over and wants to reproduce what you've done, or he sees this. Slide. Uh, this is my favorite ticket. Uh, we've had server crashes, and uh, we did some research, and there was the suggestion to take out some dynamic libraries from the load path to keep the server from crashing. After that, it didn't crash anymore, but it didn't connect to the backend database because that was what the dynamic libraries did. So we did some more research, and we found the suggestion to take uh, certain dynamic libraries into the load path. And when we asked um, SAP what we should do and make up your mind, they said, no, those are two completely different issues. And I think those nodes still exist in this form. Um, so, yeah, you're supposed to take out the libraries and take them in at the same time. Slide. Uh, I'm not psychic. I've, 
Sorry? I'm not psychic. Yes, sorry. <laughs> I'm doing this the first time too. Um, I'm running out of time. I was going to do something about security too. Uh, there has been some previous work about that. The best talk I've ever seen was last night. Um, if you haven't seen that, you should go get the video. I wanted to add two more small stories. Maybe I can get the first one done. Slide. Uh, if, you're, if you have authorization to browse data but not edit it, which usually happens, um, you often still have access to the debugger. And the code looks something like this. First, there's an authorization check, which takes the user and the mode, the access mode, which is either read or write. And after the authorization check is done, the code decides whether it goes into read mode or write mode. And if you're in the debugger, you, um, I'm out of time. Uh, no, no, Just, no, no, no. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm sorry, we, there was a disconnect between us. You've actually got 30 seconds left. Okay. Um, yeah, so if you go to the debugger, wait for the authorization to succeed and then change mode from R to W, you get to write. That's all it takes. And this is actually considered a feature and not a bug because it's <laughs> way too much paperwork to, yes. Uh, can you move to the last slide, which is an ad? Last slide, 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 slide. Thank you. I'm um, gonna end here. <laughs> Okay, I think, I think we're, we're, we're learning. We're working out the bugs as we go along. Are we doing all right? Okay, haven't lost you yet? All righty. Yeah, I think uh, Sai actually volunteered his laptop up at the top here as a timer for the speakers, but I think we're not actually, we're not syncing up correctly, so I think we're just going to close it to avoid confusion. Um, so you're comfortable with just getting a one-minute warning and being fine since you have yeah. one slide? Back. Hmm? One slide. Yeah. Okay. Two slides. So, uh, so you're okay with a one minute warning then? Yep. Good to go? Okay. And three, two, one, go. Hi, I'm uh, Peter Jackson, also known as Greenhack. I'm from Scotland in the UK, so hopefully you can understand my accent. I have a tendency to talk quickly, so I try to slow down so I don't want to get the record. Um, so I've uh, hacked together a SMS port scanner. Um, for use hopefully on the Congress GSM network uh, using a combination of Nmap, an old Nokia 60085 phone, uh, a little EPC and some Ruby code that I hacked together last night mostly. Um, why did I do this apart from the geekiness value? Uh, when I was at HAR two years ago I didn't have a a laptop, all I had there was a GSM phone. Um, if everybody who has a GMS, G, GSM phone on the network, uh, raise your hand, please. And put your hand down if you have a laptop. So everybody, up ha hands again. Put your hand down if you've got a laptop with you. Right, so people with hands up, this is really for you. <laughs> Not many, five or six. Um, and as well as um, giving people without uh, a laptop something to play with, uh, hopefully we'll all learn some interesting things about the GSM network and uh, how the port scanning works. Um, so how do I go about using this? Well, first thing, it's not working at the moment. It's in my bag over there. Uh, and I've got some power issues, so it might not work at all. So I've got the a number um, 9636, X, and that spells out X-Men. Um, and if you want to get a usage of that, uh, send the word help to that number. Next slide. And the, to do a, do a scan, you just type the word scan, and then the target. Uh, and there's a few options, Nmap options that have allowed through, so um, S, capital V does a, a service scan and uh, dash 6 does IPv6 but at the moment I can only get um, IPv6 to work on the wired network if somebody uh, is able to tell me how to do it on wireless uh, see me afterwards 
And uh, the usual caveat supply, show consideration to the GSM network and everybody else. And uh, that URL uh, will have some additional information, probably just those slides, but at the moment it's just a holding page. And those are my contact details. Uh, thank you very much. Even talking slowly, you almost beat the record at two minutes and 50 seconds. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing you talked slowly, clearly, consistently. That was very nice. Another thing to remember for presenters and just in general, if you have a tendency to pop your peas into the microphone, talk at an angle, and then you will no longer pop your peas. It'll be great. So Sai is up with TSA screenings and your rights. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this, especially with the uh, especially with your travels over here. So go ahead and take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, how many of you flew here? How many of you flew through the US or a TSA controlled checkpoint? Okay, so the rest of you are probably gonna smirk at some of my talk, but you guys are next. Um, <laughs> slide. This is a millimeter wave scanner. It electronically strip searches you and shows the operator the size of everything. Uh, the slides, slide, the images it shows are that. Now, the government didn't really like the quality of the images, so they got this slide. That is a, one back, that is a back ratter, back scatter, x-ray scanner. It produces a much higher quality image, as you'll see on the next slide. Um, of course, it is X-ray, and it is ionizing X-ray. So although you have only about the same chance as winning the lottery of getting cancer from it, people do win the lottery. Um, so one thing that people don't usually tell you is you have the right to opt out. If you opt out, you will get uh, a enhanced pat down. Um, that means that they will use their hands to do the equivalent of what this image does. Uh, under the law in the US, they have the right to search that is no more extensive nor intrusive than is necessary to detect the presence of weapons or explosives. So that means if you go through in wearing bike shorts, like I did, there's not really much uh, excuse that they have to touch you. Um, there are other rights that you have that they don't also tell you about. For example, you have the right to record everything on a portable HD camera. You have the right to bring medical liquids with you, like this. That is juice. You would not believe the 99% of people who are scared shitless of juice. Could you, I'm, I'm going to stop your time. Could you just stand a little bit further back from the microphone? Yes. Okay. My apologies. Yep. Um, so the thing is, yes, it actually is legal to bring through. There is a magic phrase. I have a medical item to declare. Um, the thing is, I did this. I got through TSA just fine. I was cleared and my juice was declared entirely non-explosive. <laughs> United had a slight disagreement. In fact, United pulled me from my plane, which is why I'm not giving my cognitive psychology talk yesterday, but tomorrow. Um, the pilot believed that my juice was dangerous, especially combined with the following question that I asked a flight attendant. So I asked a question about Channel 9 on United's in-flight entertainment, which relays the uh, radio as heard in the cockpit. The flight attendant answered me, and then later One minute. called people to pull me from the plane. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree that this is abs pretty much patently absurd as something that is a threat. And my issue with it is that essentially they're the ones being terrorists.
people who are being cowed into not using their civil liberties because they're afraid of retribution, either by the government or by <laughs> timers or by the corporate uh, security drones who had to clear my permanent ban for this just seconds. once so I could get here, don't have the right to live in peace. What you can do, next slide, very simple, know your rights. That is this flyer. I have 100 copies, you're welcome to one. Print it out, distribute it. If you want to know how to be calm, come to my meditation workshop. If you want to know the psychology behind it, come to my talk. Thank you very much. One slide? Yeah, one slide. Ready to go? Yeah, ready. Take it away. Hi, my name is Alexander. Uh, I want to talk to you about a nice project. This project is all about e-learning on network security, and the project is called NetSex. Um, NetSex feature is, uh, yeah, it's a nice name, yeah. We <laughs> choose it especially for this. Um, I, I'm, I'm, check, check. The I'm, speciality. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop the timer for a second. Grow up! <laughs> I, I apologize, you may continue. Okay. So the speciality of NetSex is um, it's hands-on education, so it's not just simulated. <laughs> I mean, grow up now. Um, so we have um, some real hacking going on within the scenarios. You have hands-on education, so uh, you are directly connected to the t uh, sandbox topology and um, nothing is really simulated. It's kind of simulated, but it's not a state machine thingy. So um, everything is real. You are shooting with real guns. No laugh, you know? Okay. Um, it, it never comes when you want it to. Yeah, okay. <laughs> damn it, damn it, damn it. Um, you see the code, um, you see the pages over there. It's uh, all on G code now. Um, this talk is about um, getting a community because um, this was started as a master project on the University of Applied Sciences in Bremen. And now we are transferring all of our code and all of our documentation right over to G code. But um, unfortunately, not everything is translated yet. So I need volunteers, I need people who, who, are, who want to participate in this project, maybe a hacker space, maybe educational facilities to put this, um, this, this educational project, uh, to build it up at their place and to have fun with it and to extend it even more. It's all framework based. And if you like my talk, join me tomorrow at Berlin Sites to see a little bit more or just chat me up. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a new record clocking in at two minutes and four seconds. <laughs> Although I, maybe he cheated a little bit because every time you guys laughed, I, I did stop the timer, so he'd have his full four minutes. So was that 30 seconds worth of, so is Jesse B. Semple anywhere in the audience? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a fail, isn't it? You are early. We're, we're way early. This was not supposed to happen. We, we were supposed to be fighting for time towards the end, but everybody gave really short presentations, so... Um, I, I don't, I, I, Sai just said down here in the front, you were too damn smooth, and I, I absolutely disagree with that. I don't think I could I, I be accused of being smooth in this presentation. Well, I don't know, what, what, do you think it went well? We're, we're still waiting for our last, our last speaker who's supposed to, oh, you're here? Oh. It, it, my, microphone. I have a hello hello I have a presentation uh, if you are watching for 
<laughs> I'm going to kick this uh, one out to the audience. If How not today, I well, no, 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 no. would like to do it tomorrow. How many people think we should allow it? Um, well, actually, do you, do you have slides? No. I have a, I have a YouTube video. Okay. Uh, about how long will it be? Because it will cut me. Okay. My template. Yeah, you do it. <laughs> That's it? Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. Laughing keys, laughing keys I have. You see it in the video, I have made keys since uh, 10 years. This only I have, I have keys. I live uh, for <laughs> uh, years in uh, this fabric hall. You see at the left side, um, I lived there for three years and tried to build there a temple machine. Right um, there, a temple machine is um, a moving machine, uh, open air floor, a dancing machine. Uh, it rocks 365 days a year, 8,760 hours in a year, and um, this is an animation at the Tempelhofer field from this machine, you see. And um, yeah, it's an open air, air floor to rock a party inside 365 days. It's uh, all movable and you can have there a lot of fun. And uh, all I have, uh, this are uh, my keys. And I have the keys for for one euro, for ten euro, for hundred uh, euro, for thousand euro, and also for a million. And I um, I can show it to you uh, for a million, <laughs> thousand twenty four of them. Um, I have keys in steel, and uh, I have keys for all here. I have keys. <laughs> And um, I have time. Uh, <laughs> just wait, just wait. The video tries for minutes. And um, this is uh, the temple machine. You see um, now uh, uh, animation from the temple machine inside. And after this, I have keys for all. I decided uh, to buy the airport uh, Templehof and offer 1,024 keys for 1 million euro. If anybody have a million uh, here, you can uh, pay a deposit for it. I don't sell him. You can only pay a deposit for the key. These are my keys. So this is the machine uh, you see inside. It's all movable. It's an open air floor to rock a party for all nerds and other girls and guys. Um, so, that's it. If anybody uh, want a key from me, you can, um, I have keys for all, for you. So, danke.